Hi guys, so I'm gonna this is part two of Tales from the Crypt number twenty-one. So it's part two, so it was the most unusual fraternity initiation ever seen on campus, or on any other campus for that matter. The three pledges were taken out to the old Palmer home on that infamous night fifteen years ago, and instead of the place being amusingly haunted, it turned into a house of horror. It was a, on a night in 1934 that this strange tale had its beginning. Today, 15 years later, there is still no explanation for what happened at the Palmer place. Get a load of Wil Les Wilton back there, scaring the wits out of those poor freshmen. He's gone ab about preparing this house for the initiation as if it were the closing seconds of a big game. He claims that even if it was just an old dump before, it is haunted now. And as the last step in your hazing, boys, you'll have to pass the test of courage. A lonely journey into the old Palmer place, which legend tells us is haunted. Each one of you will follow the instructions I gave on the ride out here. If anyone wants to drop out now, let him speak up or shut his mouth forever. Everyone ready? Yeah, I, g I guess so. Here's your light, Henderson. You might as well start the ball rolling. And rest assured of one thing, boys. This is no schoolboy prank, as you'll soon learn. <laughs> Wave that lantern at us from the first and second landings, Henderson. And just cool your heels at the attic until I come up for you. If you're not already bathed in cold sweat, that is. You're driving these freshmen pretty hard, Les. You must have given this place quite a build-up, because they look scared to death. From the look in Henderson's eyes, he'd kill you in a minute if he had the chance. There he is now, weaving that lantern in the first floor window. Now the fun starts. I went through that place last week. We rigged a few contraptions for the boys to trip over. I'd be good for some laughs before the evening's over. There he is again. Poor kid must have ran up all the way up to the second floor, as if there was a ghost behind him. There is, there may be more than ghosts behind him, boys. <laughs> One of them may have gotten Henderson then, because it's been several minutes since we saw him at the second floor, and it doesn't take that long to get up to the attic. Just a boyish prank, that's all. Thinks he'll turn the tables and scare us a bit. Probably sitting up there in the attic waiting to jump out and yell boo at me when I come up to relieve him. So we'll have a little change in plans to meet the emergency. Instead of Les Wilton going up there, we'll pick the second pledgy. Hey, Waters. Me? Yeah, be right there. I don't know why he did, how he did it, but Wilton's got these freshmen shaking in their boots. No guy would normally tremble at the thought of a haunted house, unless he thought there was dirty work afoot. Maybe there is. Hey, hey, look at his face, will you? Imagine that, a grown man, shaking like a teenage gal going past a graveyard. I'm beginning to think that I wouldn't like this, or I'm beginning to think I wouldn't like this setup myself. What in the world did you do to that house, Wilton? These boys have an absolute look of dread on their faces. Ah, it's nothing, just a couple of loose steps, a few cobwebs, some squeaky doors. It's happened again. Water's never reached that attic window. I don't look the likes look the likes of this. I uh, probably turned right around from the second floor, and we'll find him hiding near the front door. If these guys guys haven't got the guts to go up there, then they're not fit to be gamma deltas. You, Arling, come over here. You're the next man. Go up to that attic and tell those pals of yours to stop their monkey shines. This is a fraternity initiation, not a schoolboy prank. Uh, I don't think I c c care to go. You go all right, or they'll find you in a ditch. I didn't rig up this place just to have a couple of punks spoil our fun. If the three of you are planning to give me a scare, you'll regret it. We didn't plan any jokes like that, and I don't like the looks of this. It's n not Waters and Henderson to fool around, but, but I'll go. Spoken like a real... Gamma dealt to be. Hey, hey, look at him shaking. But the other two will have a big surprise for Arling, thinking it's their beloved Wilt Les Wilson. Maybe the kid's white right less. 
Maybe something did go wrong up there. Rats, no, there's nothing up there. Erling's at the first floor safe and sound. From the look on his face, he must have stumbled over that skeleton I'd borrowed from the lab, too. He's at the second floor. On his way to the attic. Hold your breath, boys. Here's where the real fun begins. In the next 60 seconds... Five minutes, Wilton, and no sign of Arling. All three of them gone. The stupid punks. Too yellow to take that last flight of steps. I'll show them real fear. Give me that light, Jenkins. I'll go up there myself. First to prove to all of you that there's no danger up there. And second to kill kick those guys out of that place. And out of the Gamma Delta. Maybe we shouldn't have let Wilton plan this whole initiation by himself. He's liable to go overboard in this hazing business. The boys in the house may have hurt himself, themselves. For all we know, he might have stuck some rattlesnakes in that old dump. Crash! Wh what the? I told you I didn't like this whole setup. The window, it's being smashed. It, it's Wilton. Thought I'd inject a little experiment in, a, in excitement in this initiation. Do I look any the worse for wear? Nothing to worry about here on the second floor either. Crash! The seconds ticked by in that lone the seconds ticked by in that lonely area, known as Palmer's place. Seconds became minutes, and the minutes stretched interminably. Five fifteen minutes since we saw Walton. But there's something wrong up there. Something's going on in that house that we don't know about. And the way those three freshmen hated Wilton, they may have given him a bad beating. Uh, I hope it's only that. Let's hurry. We'll comb this place until we find all four of them. Mike, Fred, search each room with a fine-tooth comb. We'll get this thing straightened out if it takes the rest of the night. Not a tra trace of anyone in the front room. Or any of the others, either. The dust wasn't even disturbed. And outside, no footprints. Which means they're all still in the house. No one on the second floor, either. And since no one could have left the house, they must be all up here there. Th the attic... This is probably Wilton's idea of a joke. Hazing the whole bunch of us. Well, well here goes. The, the, the door, it, it opens easily. As if someone else opened it before we d did. Good good heavens! It's Wilton! He, he's aged 50 years in the last few minutes. His hair, it turned white. He looks as though he's gone insane. Listen to his moaning. Uh... Within a half hour, half an hour, the police had arrived at Palmer's place, and a thorough search, search of the premises revealed one startling fact. Never seen anything like it. Never heard of its equal. That Wilton kid couldn't get a co coherent word out of him. His mind, it's cracked. He's completely insane. And the others vanished. Again and again, the police searched the building the next few days. But no further information was uncovered. And then about a week after the night of horror, there she goes, consigned to flames by the county commissioner, and with it the last trace of what happened to Arling, Waters, and Henderson. Henderson. Fifteen years ago it happened, and no explanation has ever been found as to the disappearance of the three freshmen. Or what awful horrors Les Wilton saw in the moments before his mind crumbled. The Witch's Cauldron. Greetings, dear. Well, I'm not, I'm not sure if this is the Crypt Keeper. Well, it looks like the Crypt Keeper. I don't know. Might be like an early version, but I'll just do the same voice. Greetings, dear reader. We meet again. Remember me? I'm the old witch. In each issue of this, the Crypt Crip Keeper's magazine, I brew a terror tale here in my cauldron. This time I have cooked up a chiller diller. I call it death suited him. My story begins on a black night in a deserted graveyard. The sound of digging shatters the dead silence. Just this little task, John Baxter. And then tomorrow morning, my victory will be complete. Wildly, the dark figure spades the soft earth, opening the ever-widening black hole. A few more feet and I'll reach your coffin, John Baxter. And that cursed tuxedo. Then I'll have everything. What does this strange figure who digs at graves in the black of night want with Baxter's tuxedo, you ask? 
Let me tell you his story while he digs. His name is Lawrence Cabot. We have to go back to the past, to Lawrence Cabot's college days, to pick up his story. Hey, Cabot, I heard you and John Baxter are both hot on Nancy Anderson. Cut it out, will you, Dave? You're gonna have her go to some... Do You're gonna have to go some to get her, Larry. Baxter's old man got dough, you know. That's just my trouble. I can't afford to take her out like John does. That's the way it was. John Baxter and Lawrence Cabot were both in love with the same girl. John was rich, while Larry just managed to scrape enough to get through college. All's fair in love and war, Larry, old boy. Sure, John, sure. And then that fateful day arrived. The fraternity that John and Larry belonged to was invited to a graduation dance given by Nancy Anderson's sorority. And it's strictly formal, you guys. Nobody goes without a tux. What? What's the matter, Larry? You can't afford one? It was a bad break for Larry. John had a tuxedo, and so he went to that dance, while Larry stayed behind. Darn it. It's just my luck. John, Johnny's probably making in time with Nancy tonight. But then, when the boys returned late at that night... Hey, Larry, congratulate me. Nancy and I are engaged. We're going to be married right after graduation. I, I, uh, I see. If it wasn't for that cursed tuxedo of yours, John Baxter, Nancy Anderson would have been my wife. But what happened after that, you ask? Let me continue. John and Nancy were married. Go ahead, Larry, kiss the bride. Nancy's father gave John a good position in his firm, and John was set. Take a letter, Miss Glass. Yes, Mr. Baxter. Well, in his small off, well, in his small office, Larry struggled to make ends meet, day in and day out, waiting for that phone to ring, waiting, waiting. Will I ever be a success? And brooded, I'd be in John's shoes today. I'd uh, have everything that he has. And then he made his decision. But I can't have Nancy. John, John's job, money, prestige. I'll take them from him. They should be mine anyway. I'll kill him. Larry Cabot planned it very carefully. Every detail. One night on a lonely road. Larry, I thought you were supposed to be at the house for dinner. What are you doing out here? My car broke down, John. I've been waiting for you to come along. It's good to see you again, Larry. Nancy will be thrilled. Yes, she'll probably get the shock of her life. Ugh. As he struck John, Larry grabbed the wheel and guided the car to a stop. Then he drove to a point where the road skirted at a mountainside. This is perfect. Propping the unconscious figure of John behind the wheel, Larry released the brake on the car and let it roll towards the cliff edge. Then... They called it an accident. Larry's plan had worked perfectly. At the funeral, he confronted the grief-stricken Nancy. Chin up, Nancy. He wouldn't have wanted it that way. Subs. <laughs> the next, the months passed, and La Lawrence Cabot came to call more and more often at the home of the young widow, Nancy Baxter. You've got a whole life ahead of you, Nancy. You can't throw it away. I suppose you're right, Larry. And then one evening, Nancy, you know how I felt about you ever since college. You're sweet, Larry. Marry me, Nancy. Let me take John's place. I love you. I've always liked you, Larry. Then say yes, say yes. All right, Larry, I'll marry you. And so Larry had gotten what he'd wanted. Nancy was going to be his wife in his room the night before the wedding. Ha ha, I won at last, John Baxter. I've won at last. I've got it all. Everything I would have gotten if it wasn't for that tuxedo you had when we were in college. But now I... Ah, uh, your tuxedo! That would crown my victory. Tomorrow when I marry Nancy, I'll wear your tuxedo. The one that they buried you in. The gates to the cemetery creaked open and Larry, his eyes wide and staring, entered. He carried a spade. Slowly, he made his way up across the graves between the headstones until he came to the one marked John Baxter.
Just this last task, John Baxter. And then tomorrow morning, my victory will be complete. And uh, this is Lawrence Cabot's story so far. Wait, hear that hollow boom? The coffin. Let's see what he's up to. Hard now to open your casket and strip you of your last possession, John Baxter. Hmm, four months in the ground hasn't hardened any. It's still in good condition. Larry Cabot removed the tuxedo from the corpse of John Baxter and recovered the grave. Then, and now for some sleep. Tomorrow is a big day. You think he's mad, don't you? Well, you may be right. In any case, the next morning, Larry dressed in John's tuxedo. Yes, John, it fits fine. I fitted everything of yours. Fine! Ha! The church was hot. And as Larry stood in the vestry, waiting for the ceremony to begin. Whew! It's certainly hot in here this morning. I, I, I feel strange. Soon the familiar strains of the wedding march echo through the vaulted room. It must be on my imagination, but I feel as though this suit were crushing me. Nancy made her appearance and started down the long aisle. Hurry, uh, I can't breathe. Uh, I don't think I can last through the ceremony. Larry's brain was reeling. Everything swam before him as he stepped forward. Crushing the life out of me. Hot, can't breathe. We are gathered today to witness the... There were flashes now, then that dizziness. Let him speak now or forever hold his peace. John, he's crushing me, killing me, I, I... In a last mad fit, before the blackness closed in, Larry tore John's tuxedo from himself. <laughs> Larry, what is it? I now pronounce you what? The group had that had gone to witness the wedding was shocked. Someone rushed for the war forward to examine the prostrate Larry. He he's dead. Dead? Yes, he was dead. After a medical medical examination was made. Strange. This report says that Larry died of poisoning from the embalming fluid. Embalming fluid? How did Larry ever come into contact with that? <laughs> we know how, don't we, dear reader? When Larry got hot under the collar, his body absorbed the embalming fluid, which had contaminated John's tuxedo. And now Larry really has everything that John has. No Nancy, no job, no prestige, no nothing. Just a nice cool coffin in a nice cool grave. And that's the end of that, um comics so i hope you guys enjoy this video if you could like comment and subscribe that'd be appreciated um thank you all for watching and i'll see you guys later